Good morning. This is uh, Gerardo Otero, and today uh, I will be lecturing about the theory of political cultural formation, otherwise called the collective empowerment theory. So I'm going to share my screen to aid in uh, this presentation. Uh, in order to illustrate the theory, I'm going to be focusing on the case of the Mexican peasantry and to some extent on the case of uh, an indigenous movement in Ecuador as well. So um, whom we have here is Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, who in a certain way is the result of uh, this strong mobilization by a number of peasant movements that led to his election in 2018. So this is the outline of uh, what I will be presenting. First, I will present uh, uh, what have been the strategies of transformation uh, in the 20th century. And this is based on my professor, Eric Olin Wright's book, um, Envisioning Real Utopias, where he does uh, a uh, great chapter on this uh, particular topic. Then I will give you a brief uh, summary of the National Regeneration Movement, Morena, which is the current uh, uh, party in power in Mexico as of 2018, December of that year. Then I will uh, plunge into the political cultural formation theory and finally offer a few conclusions. So on the first point, uh, Eric Olin Wright identifies three main strategies of transformation, each of which uh, assumes itself to be revolutionary. In that sense, a strategy of transformation, transforming a, a society in a revolutionary way. Um, the first one is called ruptural in the sense that uh, it is based on a direct assault on the state usually by violent means. And the idea is to smash capitalism and to move into socialism first and ultimately into communism. Uh, one major example of this particular strategy is what we had in the case of the Russian revolution in 2017, eventually the Chinese revolution. Uh, you could also say that the Mexican revolution was to some extent a, a ruptural type of uh, revolution, except that it was not socialistic in intent, or at least in result. Uh, it ended up being um, mostly a capitalist type of revolution. You can also say that, that both the French and the American revolutions were of the ruptural type. They were capitalist revolutions that tried to subvert the more feudal type of societies that uh, they were fighting against. Uh, the second type is the interstitial or autonomistic strategy of transformation. You can uh, think, for instance, of uh, the hippie movement in the United States, where you know, rather than directly confront uh, capitalism, they built their own communes away from capitalism. And so in that sense, <clears throat> they went into the interstices of society to try to become autonomous from the state and build the kind of society that they aspire to without interference of uh, dominant society. Finally, we have uh, what uh, Eric Golden Wright calls the symbiotic uh, strategy of transformation, which tries to change society through the electoral process. And so in that sense, you can also say that this is a social democratic kind of uh, strategy. Uh, symbiotic means that both uh, you know, the dominant and the dominated win in, in this kind of transformation. So in contrast to the previous two strategies, which are based uh, on zero-sum logics, you know, what one side loses, the other one gains, uh, 
in the symbiotic uh, strategy, it's supposed to be a win-win kind of situation. So uh, that's a very important uh, difference here. So let me uh, briefly uh, recount the story of Morena in Mexico. Uh, Morena represented a convergence of both the social left, which you could say that's where the interstitial strategy lies, and the political left, which is where the symbiotic strategy lies. And so that convergence led into what might be called, and in fact, Morena called itself a social movement party. So that's peculiar because, I mean, most political parties are presumed to be acting almost exclusively in the sphere of politics. Uh, and I mean, you know, the formal politics of the state where social movements act primarily in civil society. So when you have a social movement party, that means that you have a social actor that is acting both in civil society and in the formal politics of the state. So that is the peculiarity of Morena in Mexico, movement for national reconstruction. So a brief history is that it was born in 2012. Uh, eventually, in meteoric time, relatively speaking, uh, it experienced its first electoral triumph in 2018, uh, when 30.1 million people voted for Morena, and that represented a 53.2% of the electorate. So that's considered, you know, very, very huge. And especially when you have 63.4% uh, of citizen participation in the electoral process, uh, that was considerably higher uh, than prior elections, which used to display a fairly high rate of abstentionism. Uh, and very importantly, Morena also had uh, what is called a constitutional majority in Congress. Uh, not just by itself, but also with its allied parties. A constitutional majority means having 66% of the vote in both the Chamber of Deputies and the Chamber of uh, Senate, Senators. So with uh, uh, you know, these super majorities, you are able to reform the Constitution. And there were a few significant reforms, including uh, a major new labor legislation that had not been modified in more than 100 years. Um, so uh, there has been a contrast with uh, the previous policy of neoliberalism in the form of assistentialism. I mean, neoliberalism had a few assistentialist uh, programs, but uh, if you consider the, the budget that was allocated to social assistance programs, in contrast to other Latin American countries, Mexico's was really quite pitiful. Uh, it represented only 9.3% of public expenditure compared to 24.6% of Latin America and the Caribbean in 2017. And this is according to the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, which is a club of mostly rich countries to which Mexico and Colombia happen to be members. Um, and uh, Mexico also has the very dubious distinction of having one of the greatest uh, informal sectors in Latin America with 59.9%. So what that means is that uh, people uh, with this kind of informal jobs, they don't have any benefits at all. Uh, that contrasts with 28% uh, of the population being in the informal sector in 1989, uh, you know, when the neoliberal turn was just beginning. So there has been an incredible uh, worsening of precarity in labor conditions. So the fourth transformation or the four T 
is what the present government of Morena calls itself. Uh, let me explain that uh, the fourth transformation is pitching itself in contrast to the past three major transformations that have taken place in Mexico, each of which required the use of violence to become instituted. The first one was the independence uh, of Mexico from Spain in uh, 20, 1821. 1821. Uh, the second one was uh, the, uh, it's called the, the reform, uh, the new reform laws in 1857. There was a new constitution that was instituted at that time. And uh, that new constitution was particularly geared against the Catholic Church, which used to have at that time uh, about 25% of all real estate was in the hands of the church. And so that uh, constitution, the second uh, major transformation, expropriated the church. Uh, and eventually the Mexican Revolution that happened between 1910 and 2020 also resulted in uh, cons the constitution of 2017. Uh, I gave the date of 2020 because uh, in spite of the fact that uh, the constitution was legislated in 2017, there continued to be some peasant armies that were still actively resisting that particular constitution until the assassination of Emiliano Zapata, uh, which, I mean, his name is going to appear again uh, momentarily in the form of the Zapatista National Liberation Army, which appeared in 1994. I'll tell you more about it uh, in a moment. So the fourth transformation, uh, these are some of its main goals that, uh, you know, one of its main slogans is por el bien de todos, primero los pobres, meaning for everyone's good, first come the poor. We take care of the poor first, the rest of the population will also be taken care of. And um, with regard to the countryside, they want to turn the peasantry in particular from objects to agents of public policy. In other words, uh, they will become active participants in how agriculture will be transformed in the fourth transformation. So food sovereignty happens to be a major component of uh, this government's uh, platform. And once again, you know, peasants uh, are to be turned or converted into agents of change uh, they will try to recover labor sovereignty and agroecology will become the main production model. I ask, uh, well, is this an attempt to go toward eco-socialism? I guess the jury is still out on that. Why do I talk about uh, recovering labor sovereignty? Well, because one of the major implications of the neoliberal turn in Mexico in the 19 late 1980s and 1990s and so on, uh, was the bankruptcy, the mass bankruptcy of the peasantry in Mexico. I mean, the peasantry used to be the main producers of basic crops. And with their, I mean, they were made to compete with uh, uh, farmers in North America who happened to be very heavily subsidized. And a lot of the you know, the, the guaranteed prices, which was, uh, you know, kind of a minimum wage for farmers, guaranteed prices for their crops, uh, loans, you know, subsidized loans, uh, program for insurance, uh, marketing help for their products, all of that was withdrawn with the neoliberal turn. I mean, you know, one of the main things that neoliberalism meant was withdrawing the state from direct intervention in the economy. And so, um, and one of the implications of peasant bankruptcy was that a lot of them had to migrate you know, to Mexican cities where most of them didn't really find jobs. So they had to keep, keep going north. And, uh, and so they, many of them migrated uh, on an undocumented basis. 
to the United States. Some of them migrated with documents to Canada. I mean, Canada can, currently has about 25,000 uh, workers, but that's not much compared to uh, a few million that uh, went into the United States. So uh, I say the loss of labor sovereignty because uh, uh, I guess theoretically a nation is supposed to provide a majority of its workers with dignified wages. And if it doesn't, then it's lost its labor sovereignty. And so some other country has to take care of these workers. <clears throat> so what is political cultural formation all about? So I'm moving from the example to the theory itself. Um, well, I'll, I call this, or I think of this, as an interstitial emergence uh, from civil society within semi-authoritarian or weak liberal democratic regimes. And this happens by three mediating determinants, culture, state, and leadership. So let me break this down. Uh, so the mediations for interstitial emergence go uh, you know, from class structural processes to the mediations, which right now there's still a mystery. What are those mediations? Well, I mean, I just said it, you know, culture, state, and uh, leadership. I'll uh, define them momentarily. And all of that results in certain political outcomes. Uh, I will also define what kind uh, of uh, political outcomes there can be in this process. I'm going to mention three major possible political outcomes. And uh, I mean, this is uh, a little more breaking down uh, the last uh, scheme. So I consider structural processes as constituted both by, on the one hand, Class positions is determined by relations of production, which in the case of the peasantry has to do with whether they have access to land or if they're losing land, whether they have access to wages. Uh, but also very importantly, uh, structural processes include relations of reproduction. You know, how do people reproduce themselves materially? And, uh, that should, in capitalist societies, be primarily on the basis of wage incomes. But when wage incomes are insufficient to account for the re reproduction of uh, labor power, then people must uh, engage in, for instance, kinship relations, in community relations, in ethnicity. I mean, all of these are relations of solidarity that keep people alive, basically. And so when you don't have a complete proletarianization, as you know, in most uh, developing societies uh, in rural areas, most people don't really find uh, jobs that can fully account for their reproduction. And so they are with one foot in agriculture and another foot in wage labor. So the three mediating uh, determinations are state intervention, leadership type, and regional cultures. Uh, so regional cultures have a lot to do with both of these processes in structural uh, processes. Um, and they tend to define what demands people make. And these are the, well, the political class formation results. And I'm going to elaborate on that momentarily. So first, let me break down uh, what class structural processes is all about. I'll repeat, it's about class uh, relations of production and relations of reproduction. The difference is that uh, relations of production are mostly those that happen between exploiters and the exploited. Whereas relations of reproduction are those relations that happen among the exploited and the oppressed, all right? So this is where relations of solidarity lie. 
whereas relations of production are mostly antagonistic types of relationships. So the mediating determinations are the ones that shape uh, what political outcomes look like. And once again, there are regional cultures, state intervention, and leadership types. So let's go into those. But before doing that, let me define the three types of political outcomes that we will be looking at. The first one is bourgeois hegemonic. What does that mean? Well, you know, in most cases when social movements or social classes are struggling for their rights, they might get some concessions from the state. Uh, I mean, that is the most routine type of outcome that uh, after getting some concessions, these movements become co-opted by the state and therefore demobilized. Another usual outcome is that those social movements will be repressed or simply ignored. They will not get what they want. And so they become movements of an oppositional type to the established order. Finally, there is the possibility of movements both getting what they want and not becoming co-opted, you know, resisting the co-optation of the state which would leave them primed for continued struggles for more strategic as opposed to short-term uh, goals or gains, right? So in the bourgeois hegemonic uh, outcome, you probably got some short-term games. In the popular democratic, maybe you also got some short-term games, but if you continue with your mobilization and retain your independence from the state, then you will be able to keep on fighting for strategic outcomes. So what is the key question for political culture formation theory or collective empowerment theory? And I mean, I, I underline collective as opposed to individual empowerment, right? I mean, uh, there's a whole literature, for instance, um, in, in feminism, about in liberal feminism in particular, about uh, individual empowerment of women. Here, I'm not very interested in individual empowerment, but in collective empowerment for groups, communities, or classes. And so the question is, how can these subordinate groups, communities, and or classes organize to advance their demands without, and that's the key, without becoming co-opted into bourgeois hegemonic discourse. So back to the example of indigenous peasantries. And here I'm going to bring, uh, you know, some of the main determinants from PCF or political culture formation, you know, direct producers shape their demands according to their regional cultures, uh, their form organizations to pursue them in part as determined by state interventions, whether they become co-opted or not, uh, and how they generate a leadership to represent them. Uh, a leadership is extremely important because it tends to shape whether the organization retains its independence from the state, its autonomy from other political organizations, and what types of alliances, if any, the organization is able to construct with other subordinate groups and communities or classes. So uh, moving on to each one of these determinants, uh, regional cultures and indigenous demands. Uh, and I talked a little bit about this yesterday in our class. So reproduction of indigenous identity depends largely on access to land and therefore its class economic basis is on the peasantry. And peasantries in Latin America tend to be of a communitarian type in many cases. Why do I say this? Well, I say it to distinguish from the type of peasantry that was prevalent in France, for instance, 
when Marx in 1852 wrote the 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte, where Marx compared the French, French peasantry to a sack of potatoes in the sense that, uh, you know, the peasant families were very separate from each other and they were not able to constitute um, regional organizations and much less organizations at the national level. But materially, when you have a communitarian type of peasantry, that gives them a material edge to form organizations for, for struggle. And that's extremely important. So here is one example of an indigenous leader of uh, CONAE, which is the Confederación de eh, Nacionalidades Indígenas del Ecuador, or uh, National Confederation of Indigenous Nationalities of Ecuador. He noted in, when he was reflecting about this major indigenous uprising that took place in 1990, he said that we could have, we would have to look for the causes of the 1990 indigenous uprising in the cumulative exploitation and oppression that we Indians have been the object of for nearly 500 years. Even today, Indians continue to comprise the poorest and most marginalized part of society. We believe that a fundamental cause was the existence of mobilizing axes, like the defense and recuperation of land and territory on the one hand, as well as a clear unity forged by the revitalization of the ethnic identity of the Indian people. In other words, we have both the material and the cultural or identity aspects merged in one struggle, which tends to be the case in nearly any struggle. I mean, any struggle requires some kind of identity formation to account for the cohesiveness of groups, but they also have some kind of material demand, all right? So what are the implications of indigenous struggles? Well, Indian, Indian identity becomes the main rationale to fight for autonomy and control over natural resources. And I underline resources because that is the material aspect of the indigenous struggle. And so both the Zapatista National Liberation Army, the EZLN for its Spanish acronym, and CONAE, they both struggle for federal level recognition of indigenous rights and culture, or what was called in Ecuador, it continues to be called plurinationality. Uh, I should clarify that even if in Ecuador and in Bolivia, they talk about, and in Chile actually, they, they talk about plurinationality, it's not that these indigenous peoples want to secede from their nation states. Uh, that is just a way of defining how they want autonomy in their territories for their own autonomous governance, but they don't want to secede from their nation states. I think it's been a problematic term because it has given an excuse to their states of not recognizing their indigenous rights. So state intervention and class organizations. So very schematically, I'm gonna say what happened in the colonial period to indigenous peoples, they were mostly dispossessed and, uh, or, or, you know, the, and they were exploited as Indians. In the independent state, uh, or the independent state tried to wipe out the Indians. You know, they, they wanted to exploit and wipe out the Indian identity. Why? Because they wanted to construct a national uh, concept of identity. So they wanted to turn everybody into a mestizo or white population, mestizo or white workers. And here's an example of how Ecuador's president in 1972, Rodriguez Lara, how he put it. There is no more Indian problem. We all become white when we accept the goals of national culture. 
So it was important to build this concept of national culture to oppose it to the rest of the world, right? Because I mean, all of these countries were inserting themselves in the world economy. And so they had to have a strong national identity. Unfortunately, that was seen to have to take place at the expense of indigenous identities. So there is an alternative view as expressed by Carlos Montemayor, who was his, uh, the, the late Carlos Montemayor, he was a Mexican anthropologist. And he said, recognition of Indian rights need not amount to granting social assistance to indigenous people as if they were the handicapped actors of the nation. Rather, the point would be to establish a new relation between the Mexican state and the Indian peoples. It would be a new political enrichment, the first deep and true integration of the country and not its weakening. So what have been the political outcomes of indigenous struggles? Well, there have been mostly negative state interventions that have resulted in near genocide, near extermination, and stubborn resistance. So the outcomes have been mostly, well, you know, I mean, the three types that we've talked about already, co-optation, bourgeois hegemonic, or oppositional, or popular democratic organizations. And which one of these prevailed depends on the specific uh, historical conjuncture. So the ideological challenge for the Latin American nation states has been well framed by Leon Samos, who's a sociologist at the University of California, San Diego, originally from uh, Colombia. No, excuse me, originally from Argentina, Leon Samos. So he said, Indian movements seem to be actual or potential bearers of the demand to redefine citizenship, citizenship in a way that would recognize Indian rights to cultural distinctiveness and political autonomy. Such a demand is at odds with both the model of liberal democracy being enjoined by political elites and the dominant cultural perceptions of national identity in culture in Latin America. So moving on to the third mediating determinant in political cultural formation, what is the role of leadership types and modes of participation? And here, I really want to emphasize that leadership is not an individual variable. And this is why I'm labeling it, you know, leadership types and modes of participation, because this is a relational type of variable. Um, even when you have a charismatic leadership, charisma does not reside in the leader. Rather, it is a sociological relationship between the leader and the led. If the leader does not deliver on the expectations of the led, charisma will evaporate, okay? So anyway, I am formulating these leadership types in what uh, Max Weber would call ideal types. What are ideal types? Well, these are uh, methodological recourse to try to come up with exaggerations of reality, you know, to uh, make one-sided or you know really pointed possible outcomes and then compare those with reality and see what is the deviation between the ideal type and actual historical instances of the phenomenon that you're studying. So in this case, I'm talking about three major ideal types of leadership. One, building also on Max Weber, who talked a lot about charismatic leadership. Uh, so charismatic, and I put it as hyphen authoritarian, because that's what tends to happen, you know, with charismatic leadership. Charismatic authoritarian, the second one is corrupt opportunist, and the third is 
democratic participatory. Uh, unfortunately, the democratic participatory kind of leadership is probably the least common, very unfortunately. But anyway, I mean, if you study reality, you might find that there is a combination of these kind of uh, ideal types. And the question is, which is the most prevalent? And what kind of implications does that have for political cultural formation or for the collective empowerment of the group or the community or the class that we are studying? So leadership types and modes of participation, examples uh, in both the Zapatistas and the Conaye, we had a collective type of leadership the motto was, for the Zapatistas at least, to govern by obeying. What that means is a very radical understanding of leadership as not emanating from the leader at all, but in trying to obey the constituents. So whatever the constituents want, that's what the leader represents. Any detour of representation from what the constituents want would not amount to obeying that constituency. So Subcomandante Marcos, who was a major spokesperson for the Zapatistas, he was no doubt very important, but when it came to negotiating with the state, only indigenous peoples or indigenous leaders negotiated or led the negotiations in Mexico. Uh, consensus has been used as a mode of decision making. Uh, although there was some internal infighting uh, in the Conaye, mostly to determine whether the organization participated or not in government, all right? That was a different kind of outcome from the one that we had in Mexico with the Zapatistas. The Zapatistas stayed loyal to their autonomistic or communitarian type of stance. You know, they didn't want to have anything to do with the government, so they didn't accept any kind of development project from the government. Whereas the, in Conaye, they did. Uh, I mean, to the point that at some uh, point in time, uh, their major leader became Secretary of Agriculture. All right, that did last. After two years, they broke with the government. They withdrew from the government back to their autonomistic type of stance. So, but that did cause some infighting in Conaye. Uh, but at least uh, it, it led them to eventually rectify their, their position. So the Zapatistas in Mexico, um, the multicultural and radical democratic view proposed by the Zapatistas goes well beyond the conception of a pre-constituted and transcendent national interest of the type that uh, Rodriguez Lara, for instance, wanted to constitute in Ecuador, or that every nation state really wants to constitute. You know, they want, uh, like uh, Comandante David put it, they want a world where all the worlds fit, you know, even the peculiarities of indigenous peoples. So the, the EZLN proposes that each group constitute itself politically with its own identity, and they want to be able to fit in, not to be assimilated into some national identity. So conclusions, and I'm gonna have about four or five uh, different types of conclusions. I guess four theoretical, one for Morena in particular, you know, the major example that we talked about. So in terms of uh, economic conclusions, uh, here's what we have for indigenous struggles or what they represent in the midst of neoliberal nation states. So they are fighting for the decommodification of nature. And so the main challenge to neoliberal globalism and its privatization trend regards the preference of many indigenous struggles for collective or communitarian types of productive arrangements and property rights. On the political realm, what they want is the expansion of popular democratic class organizations 
which if you think about this in terms of civil society, that would represent an expansion, a strengthening, or as Jonathan Fox put it in, in his uh, uh, study about Mexico, as the thickening of civil society. And so if you have a thicker, a stronger civil society, that will exert a greater pressure vis-a-vis uh, -vis the state. So they gain power to shape state interventions in their favor. Social actors, thus politically formed, reach what I call a subjective moment of struggle. Uh, let me explain here that subjective, the word subjective in English is problematic because it has two nearly opposite meanings. You know, For instance, the Queen of England, now gone, uh, but she had all their, her subjects. And in that sense, they were their, her subordinates. But here I mean like the subject in a sentence, that is the active part. And so a subjective moment of struggle is when people become agents of their own history, all right? And uh, indigenous peoples, they want a societal and not merely a liberal democracy. Societal in the sense that, you know, civil society really expands itself, perhaps absorbs a lot of the functions that used to be performed by the state and fulfill their demands and their interests. On the cultural realm, a societal democracy would be distinguished by its ability to treat members of its polity according to their specific needs and identities. So both difference and equality counts. Uh, remember we were talking about bureaucracy yesterday, and one of the features of bureaucracy is that it treats everybody as equals. Well, in the case of indigenous peoples, they want both equality, but also to get the recognition of their difference. And that difference, in spite of the fact that it was uh, constructed by the dominant, well, that is how they have been constituted, and want, they want to negotiate with national societies in their own terms, in a world where all the worlds fit. And at their own pace, you know, they may become more alike the rest of society, or the rest of society may become more similar to them. So theoretical conclusions, political cultural formation, constitute, uh, the constituents are culture in the sense that it constitutes the demands and the objects of struggle. State intervention constitutes or shapes the character of uh, class organizations and the relative independence from the state and the ruling class. And leadership type and modes of participation shape or contribute to shaping or conditioning the independence of the organization its autonomy from other uh, political organizations, for instance, from political parties, and the kind of alliances that they're able to establish. Uh, what about Morena? What are Morena's challenges? This is at least what I saw in a talk that I gave at the National uh, Autonomous University of Mexico in 2018, in November, after the triumph of uh, Morena uh, elections, in the, uh, you know, in the national elections. And at that point I say, well, you know, one of the roles of Morena is gonna be to establish a balance between the state and the social movements in that particular relationship, you know, so that social movements would be respected and not absorbed by the state. So that social movements would preserve their independence from the state. Very importantly, in order for that to happen, is to not vacate grassroots leaderships. Because I mean, it can happen that, you know, once the progressive party is in power, it absorbs a lot of the social movement leadership for, you know, to become uh, govern, government functionaries or officials, and then, the social movements become vacated of their own leadership. So that's why it's very important to continuously be creating and forming new leaderships. 
or you know, I mean, to generate more democratic leaders. And very importantly, also mediate with the bourgeoisie. Because remember, here we're not in the ruptural strategy of transformation. We're not in the interstitial or autonomistic mode of transformation. We're in the symbiotic. So there has to be a mediation with the bourgeoisie so that the bourgeoisie doesn't escape, doesn't fly, doesn't go away. You know, they, they have to keep investing in ways that will be regulated, you know, probably more regulated to move in a direction of greater uh, redistribution, greater equity in society. And that's it. Next week, maybe we can address some um, some questions from the class. So I'm going to stop my share and say my goodbye and my good wishes for you on Thanksgiving when we will not be able to meet, but I will continue to expect your assignments for week five. Bye-bye.